Good afternoon, beautiful beings of light. Welcome to the Crone Zone Conversations with the Ancients. Today is a special day. We have Terry Suzuki. I'm Priscilla. This is Heather, and we're the Crones. Hi, Terry, and welcome. Hi. So Thank glad to have you here. We always have fun when you're in town. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> loves watching you. That's right. <laughs> and we are now calling this monthly meeting Terry's Tales because she always has such wonderful stories to tell us. So I don't, can you see the chat room at all? We've got Starfish, Hi Starfish, and Indigo Jaguar Intuitive Art. So hi Heather and White Dragon. And Sun Psychic Jean. No, Sun Psychic Jean can't make it today. Oh, she's, oh she was apologizing. For yeah, that. Okay. she can't make it, but that's cool. But hi everybody in the chat room. Thanks for joining us. So what's Terry been doing this weekend? Well, Terry, Terry's been uh, doing a lot of meditation. She's been talking to starfish a lot. Cool. Uh, she's she's what, uh, a good friend of mine. She's also uh, a student. We were both students of the same teachers. So sometimes I love it's nice that. To... Yeah. Yeah. So just basically hanging out. I was on Allie's show this morning and it was really interesting. It was, there was oh, not a lot of mediumship going on, but a lot of uh, uh, angels and, and spirit guides and a, a deity called Kitsune. Uh, Kitsune. Yeah, we were talking about food uh, and what we cook for holidays and uh, I, I don't cook turkey because half of my household is Japanese and they don't like turkey. So we cook other things and we got we got on to food. And so then somebody asked a question, do you, you know, can you bring us a message uh, or from Kitsune? And I'm like, uh, are you talking about the food? Because we had just been talking about food. You know, there's Kitsune ramen, but there's also a minor deity called Kitsune, who is a, a fox. And, oh, I love um, foxes. Yeah, so it was a message from Kitsune. Cool. And um, what did Kitsune have to say? Uh, Kitsune uh, was just talking a little. Kitsune is a female deity and in Japan, and she has a lot of little roadside uh, shrines. And she was talking about uh, our vision, that if we could just get down on her level, and I was following her as she went along the, the sidewalk, um, that we could see elementals better. We could see little bits of magic that we miss. And we should all be crawling around on our hands and knees in the garden. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> she spared us that, and she <laughs> uh, instead gave uh, anyone who was watching the gift of a little bit of enhanced sight. So <gasps> Lovely. Lovely. Wow. I wonder if that'll work when we go back to watch it, those of us that didn't see it in the first place. I would it imagine would, that energy yeah. will be there. Yeah, it will. She said that, that it, whether oh, cool. you're watching live or watching later, that this would uh, well, it's work. cool that it was an animal, because that's what we're talking about. Yeah, that's what, that fits right <laughs> in with our Animal Sunday, right? Yeah. That's perfect. So we're going to listen to some of... Uh, Actually, both ladies' stories. Yeah. Unusual happenings. Unusual happenings with uh, animals. And not necessarily spirit animals, just an animals. Our yeah. animal friends. Uh -huh. So you yeah. want to start off with, I love the smoky story, but. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, so I I am an animal lover. I love all animals. Um, I grew up with uh, lots of cats. Um People in my family were allergic to dogs, so we oh. we had dogs, but they all lived at Grandma's house, which was real. They're not. It's she lived in the country, and it wasn't. It wasn't that we're going to send it to Grandma's house, and really meant, you know, they were no. Going I, that's this Grandma collected my kids' cats because they mm -hmm. became allergic, so they all went to Grandma's house for real out in the country because we lived out in the mm -hmm. country. We still yeah. have them. <laughs> yep. And we still have one of them. She's 19. Yeah, so that that so I have dogs now, but I didn't have dogs as a kid. I had cats mm -hmm. and horses. And uh, I had 
what I, I call my horse grandma, but really I probably should just say I had a country grandma and I had city grandmas, but my country grandma was my horse grandma who uh, always well, took the horse me. lovers. That's the only thing that matters is the horse yeah. grandma. Yeah. <laughs> Horses, <laughs> three of us here. <laughs> and so uh, two of these stories are actually going to be about uh, my horse Smokey. And to kind of preface it, I want to tell you a little bit about Smokey. So Smokey, uh, my grandmother went to an auction, a horse auction when I was probably about eight. And she bought a, li a little uh, Arabian Welsh uh, pet pony size. So kind of medium size uh, horse. And uh, he was an accident. There was an Arabian farm right next to a Welsh farm, a Welsh horse farm. And there was an accident and he was born. <laughs> so <happens. laughs> it, it happened and they just left him out in the field uh, until he was like three years old. They didn't geld him or anything. He was just out there. Nobody really handled him. Nobody, I don't even know if he could lead. Uh, but anyway, they decided eventually to geld him and then, put him in the auction to get rid of him. And I went to visit my grandmother and she said, oh, I bought you a horse. Why don't you go out and look at him? So I ran out into the yard to the, to the corral and I saw him. I got into the feed bunk and I'm like, called him over and he came right over to me. And I'm just like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to name you Smokey. And I just, I just slipped onto his back and I rode him around the corral with no saddle, no bridle, nothing. The and horse, we rode him horse whisperer, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> rode him around and then my grandmother happened, her sink wasn't, didn't have a, a, a window to see out. So she must have just finally walked by the door, came out screaming, get off that horse now, you know, <laughs> and he went to the feed bunk and just let me off. And I didn't know that he had never really been touched. It's a wild horse in there, completely wild, new gelding. Not there's and no you reason. Came in five seconds. Yeah, that's cool. There's no reason I should have been alive after that. <laughs> but I just that that's that's how me and Smokey were. We just he was my heart horse. I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So, um. So this was a uh, this was a dream or a meditation. Now I can't remember if it was a dream or a meditation, but I think it was a dream. And I was going to my grandmother's house. And so before before you go off into the dream, how long did you have? How long did you have Smokey in your life? I had Smokey in my life in from eight years old till about twenty. Right. Uh, he foundered and he uh, kind of passed away early. He, he Horses should live a lot longer than. Right. Mm. Mine but didn't he, live very long either. Yeah. But, you know, he was in a lot of pain, so it was good. You know, he, right. he really recovered from the founder. Right. Um, and founder, for people who don't know horses, is that the inside, the bones inside their feet fall down. And so every step is painful. Painful. Yeah. It can even go through the hoof, bottom right. of the hoof. And and that it usually twists. Sometimes yeah. it twists. It's it's a horrible thing for them. Yeah. But it's horrible. Anyway, I'm sorry. I digress. <laughs> he was a lovely horse and he could get, uh, we lived in the city, but we had a pasture around our house and he was, like Houdini, he could get out when he wanted to and usually went to our lawn to eat and lay down and but once in a while visited the neighbors. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The police were well acquainted with Smokey, the Houdini. <laughs> the Houdini. I had a horse like that that was a Houdini horse. He could get out of anything. It was a miniature horse, but yeah, mm -hmm. he was a Houdini. Yeah. So, um, this this dream happened, of course, many, many years after Smokey was gone. And uh, it, it happened 
I'd say like about a year and a half ago anyway. So I was traveling to my grandmother's house. And <laughs> just a minute. Starfish asks what's a gilding. Oh, oh gilding. He's uh, neutered. That, that, yeah. <laughs> the boy horse who is no longer a stallion. He's so it's a gelded, uh, a, a gelding is a very nice horse. They're very, uh, um, general classic. Yeah, yeah, classic horses. Whereas mares, you, you cannot, uh, spay a mare. And mares are, uh, they're nice horses too, but they can be a little more challenging, a little more temperamental. They're more yeah. emotional, <laughs> <laughs> pure yeah. and simple, more hormonal. Right. Yeah, and I mean, the only stallion I ever rode was an Arabian stallion. And boy, did he have pep. <laughs> I yeah. mean, he was ready to go anytime. <laughs> yeah. So. So, so for those who don't know about, you know, mares, geldings and stallions, in general, we don't ride stallions very much. They're, mm -hmm. they're a, a lot more, well, they can be dangerous. I've, I have read stallions. They're aggressive, they they're unpredictable, mm -hmm. and if there's a female around, look out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I've also rode a stallion before that was a, a kid's rode him. He was just a good horse. I mean, it, it's all mm -hmm. a little bit different, but in general, your basic horse owner is probably not going to own a stallion mm -hmm. because it's too, too much work. Too much. Too much horse. Yeah. Too much horse. <laughs> just too much horse. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, in this dream, I was going to my grandma's house and I really don't exactly know how I was traveling there. I kind of think I was flying, but I was flying along the road. And, excuse me. She lived in the, uh, on a, uh, the Yakima Indian Reservation. Hmm. And uh, I was going there and as I was going there, I got stopped on the road by a, a farmer walking a white mare and foal across the road. And I, you know, I probably could have just flown over them, but I didn't. I somehow obeyed the traffic laws and watched them. <laughs> and, mare and, foal in. and But now as I look back on it, I think that that was like a gatekeeper. That there's yeah. so much meaning to the mare and the white mare and white foal going across the road. Hmm. And even if I revisit this, I still see them. So there's some sort of gatekeeper, some sort of thing to slow me down a little and to make me think. And after Did they cross, have any idea what that white mare and foal crossing the road might indicate? I don't know. Interesting. Somebody in the chat room might have an idea. I did look it up and it meant something. And then when I was look, trying to research for this show, I couldn't find it again. Oh, no. Um, what it meant. But I mean, it can mean a lot of things like uh, you're on the right path, purity, a lot of different things. So, but if somebody else sees it, in, in always with my stories, if you see something else in here, speak up. It's, it's always interesting. It is always interesting. Mm -hmm. Different perspectives. Yeah. yeah. So right after they they crossed, pretty soon I came to my grandmother's house and she was standing out in the road uh, waiting for me. And she was talking to my aunt, who has also passed away. But my aunt didn't talk to me. She, she kind of waved and then left. Um, so I thought that was interesting because my aunt... Uh, she she was a person who you know wasn't necessarily super friendly, so that that was just kind of interesting. But she'll show up again in our next in in one of the next stories. So <laughs> anyway, so my grandma and I went to her backyard, and that she had a very square yard, very just square, and the house was near the front and kitty corner. In the back was a corral for the horses. And in this scene, to the right of the corral was a hitching post, and it had four horses on it. And there was another horse uh, kind of under a, 
it used to be a dog run and there was another little horse in there. And I saddled my grandmother's roan. She always rode a roan, a strawberry roan horse. I, I don't know how that she always ended up with one, but she seemed to always end up with one. And so I saddled her horse and I took it down to the porch where she was waiting. And we just greeted each other and she just, she hung on to her horse. And, oh, purity and freedom, okay. So then I went back up and I was trying to figure out where I was kind of had these five horses to choose from. And I was a little bit confused and I was looking at a white one that looked like my Smokey, but I could see that it wasn't my Smokey. And then I saw another little pony that I used to ride, Coco, and I, I liked her, but the bridles were all mixed up. And as I was trying to sort out the bridles, my grandma came and said, Terry, go get Smokey. He's in that pasture. And she pointed to the fence. And in real life, if I had have went out where she had pointed me, I would have been halfway on her property and halfway in the road. Um, hmm. in a little highway. So I, she came and opened the back gate for me and I stepped out and I stepped out into this new pasture. So back where we were, it was summertime and it was beautiful and it was warm and it was green and beautiful. But when I stepped into this pasture, it was frozen. It had deep snow and it was really, really frozen. And in fact, I even saw the carcass of a frozen horse. So it must have been a very, very old Eek. horse. Yeah, it was It was like I stepped into this whole very different world. And my horse, Smokey, was there. And he, he was holding still, but I don't want to say frozen, because once I kind of clapped to make him move, he started moving. Right. And my grandmother was at the top of the pasture and she opened the gate and and Smokey went through. What color was your Smokey? White. He, he White. was blue or gray, but all gray horses turned right. white. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so then I saddled and bridled Smokey and got him down by my grandmother and we were there and we were both sitting on the horse and the back gate was open and we just chatted a little bit and then we were gonna go for our ride. And it was, it made my heart so happy to see my grandma, because this is the first time my grandma has appeared to me in a dream. Oh, wow, cool. And, uh, or in, in any kind of thing, I was just so happy to see her because she was my, uh, just, she's, she's- You're everything I, as a kid. Yes, yes everything as a kid and so mm -hmm. i woke up crying and and didn't get to talk with her much but i mm -hmm. i remembered how how that she always directed us around horses taught us how to saddle and bridle a horse i i kind of felt good that i got to saddle and bridle her horse uh for her rather than her as a right that her always bright saddling and bridling my horse Oh, that's yeah. lovely. Yeah, that is really getting lovely. to do back for her. Yeah, yeah. getting to yeah give back a yeah. bit and to see your yeah. grandmother. I I know that feeling when I saw my father in a dream. Uh, I woke up crying because it was just so wonderful to mm -hmm. feel that energy again. And yeah, mm -hmm. I can I can relate to that for sure. Yeah, How beautiful. Yeah that that was that was such a lovely lovely gift to see my grandmother, see my, my heart horse again. That was, that was right. really. Yeah. Lovely. You had a close connection. It's like I did with my horse and uh, his name was Charlie to me. And it, when we rode in shows, it was Sir Charles, but that's, that's what his name was when I got him. And mm -hmm. uh, he was a jumper, uh, not a, he was a hunter which means mm -hmm. the jumps aren't over four foot tall. Yeah, the jumping feet, they're usually much higher. They start at four. 
Wow. But usually they weren't over four foot. It was usually over rough terrain. You know, you'd have bridges you'd jump over or fences they'd build between trees that they have to go over or things like that. I mean, I've even jumped over park benches. But uh, and that was interesting. <laughs> but I remember there was one year we had... Uh, I, I used to go out to the stable was, and they had classes all the time, horsemanship classes. And every other year or every year, I don't remember what it was, they would have uh, different stables compete against each other. So they would have teams and you had to try out for those teams. Well, I got to be the replacement team. You know, I wasn't the first one, but I was, I got invited. That was the biggest thing is I got a letter saying, come look, <laughs> you know, come, come, you know, try out. And uh, when we were there, you know, I hardly ever rode Charlie. It was this other gal that was riding that was on the team and they were doing one of these cross country type uh, courses. And I remember standing down at the bottom where everybody went in, you know, it'd be a team of three that go in because <clears throat> they would take the fences all three together and then every once oh, in a while cool. be one two three but most of the times they took all the fences together that's all neat. three horses so it was wow. kind of impressive but i remember being there and watching him and being with him sort of you know as he was doing the fences and when he got done um one of the, the other horse owners that I knew, it wasn't Bob Lewin, but somebody else came up and said, you rode him over every one of those fences, didn't you? <laughs> and I realized that, yeah, I had. Um, and it was really funny because she came out. Ener energetically, she was on that horse's back. I was, I was riding him energetically over each fence. And when the girl that was riding him, came in she's he did so fantastic i didn't have to do anything he just went and told me took it and i'm going yeah i know why <laughs> <You know? laughs> she didn't do anything and if i hadn't been riding him he wouldn't have taken the fences either <laughs> mm -hmm. he was uh, kind of stubborn sometimes you know um, so he was your horse he was horse. my horse and he was yeah. my heart horse yeah i sure. know that he died early i know that i sold him when i went to college and it was a big discussion evidently between the other quote barn rats and myself because mm -hmm. i would go to the other horse shows even after i wasn't riding they didn't want to tell me where he was or how to get to him because oh, i wanted to go check up on him and that was a mistake as he, his eyes were dead. You know, um, he was just so unhappy. And I am oh, that's so horrible. glad that he passed early. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew when he had passed. I said, oh, okay, he's out of misery. I know he's he's gone. But he lives in her bedroom. Yes, he does. Oh. On my bed at night. You got Sometimes a horse it's really in weird. Room. There's like she has a horse in her bed. Is that not cool? He lays down. I had come across him in his stall one day, where he was laying down, and he looked like just a humongous dog. And most horses just automatically get up real quick, and he just stayed there until I got there and could pet him. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I swear that's how he lays on the bed. He's on the bottom of the bed, curled around the bottom corner. Isn't that wonderful? There's just enough room for me to lay in there, but sometimes you can feel a move in the whole bed. <laughs> and there's nobody else in it but me, but the whole bed shifts. And so every <laughs> once in a while, you know, he's So there. you guys in the chat room, remember, <laughs> when you feel those animals of yours jumping <laughs> on the bed, you, you think you feel that? You absolutely do. You do. You and absolutely do. Those are your fur babies that have moved on. And Charlie is not the only animal I have in there. <laughs> no, she has a menagerie. I have a menagerie. But I'm a, actually, if I could change all the dimensions and be with them, there's not room for me on that bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's all animals. <laughs> I, I feel my cats that have passed on jump on my bed. And I know oh, which I feel that too. too. I the dog jumping, jumping on. In Charlie's case, he just puts a paw up and you can feel the whole bed. I mean, puts a hoof up to get up and you can feel the whole bed go. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I ever felt an animal on the bed, I was 
spending the night with some friends that lived in a, I was in England and they had uh, redone an old, you know, barn stable block. And there was a, several houses in that, in that area. It was lovely. And I went to bed that night and closed my door and I heard, I, I felt more than one cat jump on the bed. And I didn't think anything about it because I'd always had cats. But when I woke up the next morning, there was no cat on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see anything. <laughs> but you can I see also, them moving. Yeah. When I feel it, I'm usually awake, like reading a book, and I can yeah. feel them on the bond. And I thought, oh, it's, and then there's yeah. nobody there. My husband's He's not in bed. Yet. I'm aware of him when I'm asleep. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, and I had a, an, a a Siberian Husky that when she passed, I used to fall asleep on the couch and she would come up and nuzzle my hands to wake me up to go to bed. Even after she passed, I would fall asleep on the couch, but I would feel her messing with my hands to get up and go to bed. She's not there, but I could feel her there. Wow. That was her job. That was her job. Wake me up and tell me to get up. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. But you have another smoky story that really touched my heart. Yeah. yeah. So this smoky story happened a while ago uh, when my dad died. So I have been experiencing these things for pretty much all my life. And usually after somebody I love dies, they about two weeks later, they come to talk to me to tell me they're okay. And, you know, lots of you know, whatever, whatever message they want to give me. Right. Mm -hmm. And so my dad had passed away kind of unexpectedly. Now, I got to give you a tiny bit of background about this. So I used to be a hairdresser. And my dad's a hairdresser, was a hairdresser. And uh, all of my brothers and sisters, except for one, went to hairdressing school, cosmetology. And, uh, but but I was the only one that actually worked with my dad, um, where that we were in a, a shop together and, and worked. And so, you know, when you work with someone, you have more time to just chit chat and say stuff. And so my dad knew a lot about me. And at that particular time, I was married to a holy roller. <laughs> at, I had grown up Catholic. But but not a very good Catholic because um, <laughs> my mom's been to, to you know Catholicism school uh, catechism catechism. Mm -hmm. catechism every Wednesday night and unbeknownst to her we were being taught by radical nuns so all I've ever really heard about is um, hang on I gotta dismiss this okay it was like. Uh, equity and not hating people racially and what Martin Luther King Jr. came <laughs> to say and all that. So we were only being taught that. I, I know nothing about the Catholic religion, like why you go to communion or why, why, <laughs> I mean, I would go like, you know, I'd have to go, you're supposed to go and uh, confess your sins. And, um, you know, there's like a little thing you have to say and so I mean I did learn to say that but you know you go there and you know, as a kid how many sins you got I had to make up sins I did too. I, I still wonder what I, I I'm wondering if that priest was just completely entertained by sins that a little girl could not <laughs> possibly do but I know because I when I went through, we're Epis we were Episcopalian so we went through all of that too and you went with all the friends we went with all of our friends from school from what junior high, I guess it was. So we were all in there. And don't you know that pre priest was listening to a bunch of nonsense, <laughs> a bunch of preteens. <laughs> you know? Probably a ton what of nonsense. I hit my sister. <laughs> That's almost the only thing you could confess. I hit my sister, which yeah, I mean, probably, really. I probably <laughs> had to go through all my brothers and sisters. I hit them all at least once. So. <laughs> <laughs> But as I became an adult and had married this guy in a very different religion than my own, um, I started to study the Bible more and learn more things. And to be honest, become a little bit more, I, I was not worried at all before 
a little more spiritually worried about some of the things that I could do. And so one You mean your psychic ability, as in your psychic abilities were freaking you out? Yeah, all those kind of things. A little bit more worried about evil. Yeah. And so I at the time that my dad died, I was having a biblical argument with myself. And And how does one have a biblical argument with oneself? (laughs) I was trying to figure out if I was a necromancer. Because somewhere in the New Testament, it says, you know, don't don't hang out with, don't talk to or hang out with necromancers. And I was kind of thinking, that sounds a lot like me. <laughs> in my beginning, you know, so I was having this argument with myself trying to figure it out. So when my dad came to see me, uh, the vision started, in, it was in a dream. And he was standing in front of a barn, a red and white barn, with a green roof, in a big uh, yard. And there was a great big rectangular hole nearby. And my dad was there, and he was just smiling at me. He was so happy. But my dad wouldn't talk to me. He didn't want to be the... He, so my dad answer. Don't get in the middle between Terry and a biblical argument. Don't do it. (laughs) So he didn't want me to feel like he caused me to sin by talking to me since I'm a necromancer. And, uh, (laughs) you know, so he didn't talk to me. So he wouldn't get in the argument. And he just smiled at me with his loving smile. And then he reached up with his hand. And in his hands, as my vision widened out, were the reins to my horse, Smokey. Smokey was already dead by this time. He had passed away long before my dad. And he just handed me the reins of Smokey. And it was just so thrilling to see, you know, my heart was so big to see my dad and then him to bring my horse, my heart horse. And him to know not to talk to me about the argument, I kind of knew instantly he's not going to talk to me. And it's because I'm in this argument. He doesn't want me to feel like uh, he's caused me to sin. Right. And uh, I got on Smokey, and I rode him all night long. Oh, my gosh. We rode up and down hills. We just had all the fun we always had. And at the end of the night... We were riding and we rode back into the barn area. And there was my dad. And the rectangular hole had become wider with stairs. It was a grave and it had stairs down into the grave. And my dad reached out his hand for the reins. I gave him the reins and he waved goodbye. And him and Smokey walked into the grave. Oh, that brings and tears I, to my eyes. I woke up. Let me tell you, it brought tears to my eyes. I woke up just absolutely crying. Oh my god, that's a beautiful story. It yeah. just shows you how attached they get to us as we are to them, our mm-hmm. fur babies like that. I, I love that he loved me so much that he knew what to bring me to make me feel even more loved. Yeah. And he, he knew about me. I'm sure he thought it was ridiculous. I'm sure because nowadays I don't even think about that argument at all. Um, but no, but you were young, and why wouldn't you? I mean, question. and, and spe- particularly since you were going through the Holy Road, you were at the Holy Roller Church, and yeah. they're very particular about necromancy and such. Yeah. Anything that we do, they would consider us evil or demons or going to hell or whatever. Right. And I, I never told any them about that at all. I don't blame you. I wouldn't have either. Yeah. I would have been too I frightened. Just, yeah, I just kept it to myself. And I think I decided I wasn't. Well, I, I know now. I'm not. Obviously. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I don't think you're evil. I don't think you're sinning. (laughs) I'm not sinning, so. (laughs) 
Well, what exactly is the definition of a necromancy? Do we know? You I know, don't. I think it was just someone who spoke to the dead. I think that I think they were just people, probably scamming people for money. I, I think either the, that or people just didn't understand that they could yeah. actually do that. It is. It's yeah. just the supposed the supposed practice of communicating with the dead, especially in order to predict the future. Yeah. yeah. You're a necromancer. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I know. don't think you predict the future. <laughs> <laughs> I have once or twice, but I don't think that's my forte. <laughs> no, I found it was most definitely not my forte. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I get. It, I get it wrong every time. <laughs> no. Or it, uh, it'll happen, but it won't happen when I said it. With it's you know a year a down the road line. or whatever. <laughs> right. It's too hard. I, I don't want to play. Yeah, I think it's really hard because you're really just if you tell the if you do get future things, you're really only doing it on the energy of now. And That's people right. make this. So yeah, free will and all kinds of different choices, all in that. I mean, from the it minute hard. it leaves your mouth, it's past, and anything could have changed. Yeah, right. So that's true. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm going to ask the chat room: Do you guys have any fun stories to share with us about your experiences with your animals? And um, if so, let us know because inquiring fun. minds want to know. Yeah. <laughs> I remember once when uh, I had a dog in second grade, and or, you know, it's a hind 57 type, you know, mutt. And uh, my dad and the dog Blackie went out for the evening. And I was already in bed, but I came down and said, what's the matter? Where's Blackie? Is what I asked my mom. And she sent me right back to bed because my dad was coming in the back door with my dog who had been hit by a car. Yeah. And she didn't want me to see it. So um, he took him to the vet and the vet did everything he could do with her and said he would spend the night with her. If she made it through the night, she'd be okay. All I remember is that at some time, I don't know whether it was that night or later, but I do remember looking and seeing the vet sitting in a chair outside her kennel sleeping that night so i know he was there all night with that dog so even as a child she's astral projecting and um checking what, things out but the, the dog word? was okay yeah and that's mm -hmm. actually when she got back home is when i first started working with um i had read about a story in in a book about healing hands and i started working my hands on her when she got mm -hmm. back because she was so and How sick. old were you when this started? Uh, second grade would make me about seven. Wow. A remote traveling at seven years old. <laughs> wow. So, of course, she yeah. had no clue. But. I didn't know. I thought I was dreaming. You know, yeah. gee, I have a vivid imagination. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do too. <laughs> I know, yes. right? So Wolf or Oracle says, it's rough when you first discover our sensitivity, but our faith conflicts with our gifts. You're right. Correct. The divine gives us these gifts. So if anyone or anything says you're evil, they are projecting. Well, but, I don't know about projecting, but they're wrong. <laughs> and they're also being very judgmental simply because in most like cases, they probably aren't doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're... go ahead. I, you know, I've always, I've always said, even when I was like a little kid, uh, don't put God in a box. I still say that today. Don't put God in a box because you don't, you know, we don't know everything. We don't no. know everything that's happening. And, and, uh, and you always have to think outside the box. When I was in special education, I did that all the time. And fortunately for me, it knew, normally worked. Like there was a eighth grader. Teacher complained all the time because he was never sitting down. He's always standing at his chair. And I said, is he working? I said, yes. I said, can he reach the, he happened to be very short. I said, can he reach the desk if he's sitting in it? And she thought about it for a while. She says, 
no, not really. I said, so if he's standing up doing his work, is that okay? Can you put him in the bathroom where he doesn't bother anybody? He's not doing anything except what you told him to do. It's just he can't do it sitting down. Hadn't thought about that. She moved him. Everything was fine. And for the rest of the year, nobody ever complained about him standing up anymore. I think we needed to erase boxes. A uh, what? Erase boxes. Yeah, erase boxes. That was thinking <laughs> outside the box. I don't like boxes. No. And actually, <laughs> my school principal, one of the times, had said that one of the things he liked about me was that I would think outside the box instead of thinking, no, you can't do that. He'd think, how can we do it? How right. can we get it done? Yeah. Yeah. I heard you, White Dragon. It's a good thing to know you'll bring me back if I'm caught out there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking yesterday about... Um, I, apparently I signed a sole contract that said I wouldn't astral travel and I've always wanted to astral travel and I've tried all kinds of different methods long before I was told you may not, you signed a contract that you wouldn't do it. And Tell said, about your dad and when you were a kid. Oh yeah. <laughs> anyway, we were talking about it yesterday and that's what he's referring to. He's laughing. He's going to bring me back if he catches me out. <laughs> no, when I was a little girl, I would have these dreams that I was running away from my dad. He'd be chasing me down our hallway, but a long hallway with bedrooms off either side. And then my parents' bedroom was back here and our bedroom, my sister's and mine was next to it. And I was always running down this hall and he was chasing me. And just about the time he'd get to me, I would jump up and I would jump forward. And I'd you know, be like 10 feet in front of him and he would be after me again. And I thought he was chasing me to spank me for being, doing something naughty. You know, I thought he was chasing me to spank me. And after um, I started talking to him, after he passed, he was like, no, you were always trying to leave the planet. And I was trying to keep you here. <laughs> I was wow. like, what? <laughs> Is that she wasn't crazy? allowed to ask to travel. <laughs> because I guess I just won't come back. I don't like it here. And I won't come back. Because oh. I didn't belong here. I think that's oh, what it is. I mean, I like it here just fine, but apparently I really don't like it here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to go home. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? I, I, I can get that. I can get that, especially, um, you know, I love listening to NDE stories, near death experience. Are you, do you look at the channel, the NDE channel? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, do. They're fascinating. Um, my dad loved them. He loved them a lot. He he was absolutely uh, taken by Betty Eady's story. I think she was one of the first people to publish her story. So he read that before he died. And uh, another one, Ray, Raymond Moody's book was out. There. Right, right. And he really loved those. And I have to say, I do too. I always read them because it, it, it feels like home. It feels like home calling me for something. Yes, it does. I read those were books that my father had that I would read when I was a kid. Well, fairly young anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So I love those. Um, and when did your dad pass? I think, you know, I'm, I'm really bad on dates, but I think he passed about... Oh, now I remember, 1993. Right. That's when he passed. So I was uh, probably, let's see. Um, hmm. So it's probably in my 30s, mid, kind of mid 30s when he mm -hmm. died. Yeah. Well, so, you're not bad on dates. For my dad, of course, he was he was an organist, and so you have all the church holidays and stuff. I have no idea what year he passed. I can tell you it was on Palm Sunday. <laughs> but not what year. But I can't tell you what year it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I when only... did he first come, come to you, uh, or can you give us an experience of your father so, since he passed? So... That that dream with Smokey happened two weeks after he passed. Oh, wow. Um, but I have to tell you that he did things before he passed to help us. 
So my husband's father died about six months before my dad died. Oh. And my um, husband just couldn't get over it. He just, he, he actually, we had just gotten married and we had to get special paperwork because he's not an American citizen. And then it becomes quite tricky if you get married and our paperwork had not been completed all the way. It takes a long time before all that stuff gets done. But his dad was dying. It was, uh, he had leukemia and so, we got special permission for him to go back to Japan to be with his dad, but it was too late to talk to him. He had already been intubated and couldn't talk. And so it was very, very hard uh, on, on him and uh, felt like many things that he didn't get to say or didn't get to ask. And so um, my dad at one point I want to say probably in December, and he died in February, we got to talk to my dad because, uh, and he got to ask all the questions he wanted to of my dad. Oh, wow. Um, and so I got to hear those answers. So I think it, I think it was also preparing me for my dad's death. Right. Because we both uh, grew up in big families and, uh, you know, my dad was uh, one of the things that he was worried about is that his dad didn't get to have an enjoyable life because he had to take care of so many kids. And my dad said, oh, no, those the kids were my joy. And in fact, I knew that to be true, because as a, as a kid, he often called us his five Cadillacs. So <laughs> he had five Cadillacs or us. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense there were five of us in my family too yeah so it was it was you know my dad uh it that was that was just an amazing it, it's not a coincidence you cannot that cannot be a coincidence there's mm -hmm. no way that that would happen that that my husband would get to question my dad in lieu of his dad yeah you know That's how so much cool. and me get to hear that before my dad. Right. Died. Right. Yeah. And I think that also helped me cope with my dad's death a lot. I, my brothers and sisters did not do as well. Um, I didn't do well when my father died. I was angry for a long, long time. And, uh, I, you know, I didn't really realize it was all subconscious. But, yeah, I didn't do well with when my dad died because he was probably the most important person in my life to have passed at that point mm -hmm. it really one of the first so it was pretty devastating and and i remember after my first husband died remembering everything because he would say the to me the most idiotic thing well i got this so that you can do this if i if something happens to me this is what you do with it and he would say that on all sorts of different things and after he died, all I had to do was remember everything he said, and I could pull everything out. And the lawyer was so surprised that every time he asked me for something, <laughs> there it was. But I was just pulling everything together that Alan had said, and I'm going, what, did you know you weren't going to be here? <laughs> you know, what? Wow. <laughs> it, it just seemed like he had periodically say something, you need to know this for this. You have to tell us about your dad and the kitty story. I I will tell tell my final dad and cat <laughs> dad dad and <laughs> cat. So I have to back up a little bit. Okay. When my dad passed away, he was greatly beloved, and we had to have it hold his funeral in a a, a big church that was kind of a, not a church that I would have normally ever been in. Because uh, we needed a large enough venue for everybody to come. Now, my horse grandma only had two kids, my dad and my aunt. And uh, when my dad died first of all of them. And when he died, my aunt could not come into the funeral. My mom wanted an open casket, and she was terrified of death, terrified of seeing a dead body. The aunt. 
ter- absolutely terrified. So my aunt had to sit in the lobby of the church on the stairs going to the, uh, to the second floor through the whole funeral. So she didn't get to participate in the funeral. She, just, she had to sit out there because she was so afraid. Um, I actually didn't know this until a, kind of near the end of the funeral because I was looking around. You know, I'm in my own grief. I'm not really paying yeah. that much attention and then realizing yeah. she's not here and then found out where, where she was. So she was terrified of death. And um, so when I worked with my dad as a hairdresser and had all that time to chat, even though my dad had been Catholic and then kind of a slightly holy rollerish, uh, we would chat about all sorts of things. And this is what my dad always said. He said, Terry, if there is any reincarnation, which I don't believe, but if there is, I'm coming back as a cat. I'm coming back as a cat because, because I'm like, Dad, why? Why, why a cat? <laughs> You know, and he's like, because cats get to nap all day long. They just get massaged all the time <laughs> and fed anytime they want. He said, that, that is a wonderful life. I'm coming back as a cat if I can. <laughs> sure, Dad, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, then my dad did pass away. And... uh I was in college, and, and the funny thing was for 40 days after he died, I could see him out of the corner of my eye. I could see him standing around with me. Uh, but if I looked at him, I couldn't. It would, right. No, he's just right there in the peripheral. Right. Can I could see him that's, all the time. No, that's the way I can see most. Most. Yeah. People yeah, they're often in their peripheral. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, so... I graduated from college. We moved out of family housing and moved into an apartment, an apartment that we could not have animals. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I've no. I've had to do that a couple of times in my life. Yuck. Yeah. And in, in the family housing, we couldn't have animals either. So I was, you know, it's kind of it's hard because I love animals. I always almost have an animal. And when, uh, when we moved to our new apartment, my sister's cat had kittens back in Yakima and uh, they had been harassed by a great Dane dog because she also had a great Dane. And when my daughter was just visiting her for the summer, um, my daughter was an older teen by that time and uh, well in doubt. <laughs> when she came home, she had a kitten down her cleavage. Did she, so she fly not, with the cat there? There was a cat there. No, yeah, did the she fly? I'm sorry. Was did she fly on an airplane with the cat, or did she drive? No, she just okay. drove, okay. and she had this. She had this little orange kitten in her cleavage, and uh, she named him Hugby. And I didn't want Hugby. I did. I you know I wanted to not get in trouble for having cats, but I mean, who can resist a kitten? You just not can't. Me. <laughs> I'm a sucker. I let I let Hugby stay, and we just <clears throat> tried to make his stay as unobservable as possible. <laughs> and two weeks later, she went over for someone else, and she brought back Hugby's Hugby's cousin in her bra too. So we had to- <laughs> oops, <laughs> too kitty. Well, you know they need a friend. They right. are a good friend. <laughs> anyway, so I'm just going on about my life. But after a while, I noticed this kitten is really different. So the Hugby, the orange one. And I start to recognize he reminds me of my dad. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, could that could could that be my dad? I mean, no. no. The more I had this kitten, the more he acted like my dad. He had little facial things he'd do that reminded me of him. He'd do little games that reminded me of him. 
And then he was, they were Manx cats. And Manx cats, while they're very loving to their family, they're really scared of everybody else. So oh. if somebody knocked on the door, rang the doorbell, they disappear. And they would always disappear if somebody came over, even kids' friends that might come over every day, they would just disappear. But if my brothers and sisters came over, and of course they would disappear when they heard the doorbell ring, but the second that they spoke, the cat would be right out, right out. Yeah, that's to, different. <laughs> yeah, have that's to be unusual. on the table, sitting there, right in their face. Right. And that's not like, that is not what a Manx cat's like. And I thought, okay, I think. Not really I'm any cat. <laughs> that's not, most cats do disappear when strangers come in. Right. And, but the Manx are really, so they're serious that they just, they aren't going to come back out. You can't, you can't, so come out. but he, he would only, he, he would come out if the, my brothers and sisters came. I love that. And I thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe, you know, don't put God in a box. Maybe, maybe dad made it as a cat and this is dad. So let's just be nice to this cat and, you know, treat Go it. it. <laughs> And we moved to another house, the house I'm living in now, and uh, the ha the cat really coped well. And, and every time I would come home from work, the cat would meet me at the door. And um, it, it was just always there at the door, always greeted me. And one day I got home and the cat didn't greet me at the door. And I was a little confused, but I thought, well, maybe he's outside. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe he's taking a nap. I mean, it, it, you know, every once in a while he missed me at the door, but I thought, eh, okay. So I guess I should have warned people. This is one of those stories that's really weird. I, you know, you have to think about whether you whether you believe somebody could come back as a cat or not. Felt, if it resonates, <laughs> keep it. If it doesn't resonate, let it go. But this is a beautiful yeah. story. So I, I get home. The cat doesn't meet me at the door. And I'm like, okay, well, that's that's weird. And I do what the little things that you do when you get home, you know, put your purse away and, and maybe start something in the kitchen. And then I go up to my, my bedroom. And as I'm walking up the stairs to my bedroom, I, I also have my first cell phone. And as, I, as I'm walking up the stairs, I'm carrying the cell phone, which is a little, I didn't, don't think I would have normally done that. And as I'm halfway up the stairs, I'm like, oh, something's wrong, something's wrong. Something's not right about all of this. Something's different. And as I get all the way to the top of the stairs and I turn into my bedroom, there is my cat dead on the floor. Mm -mm -mm. And I can see that he was on my bed and I can see that he had a little bit of struggles and went across the bed and then finally landed on the floor and he's laying there. And he's a little bit stiff, so I know it hasn't been right then and there, but I'm, and I'm down on my knees starting to pet him thinking, oh, my heart, and then kind of like, Oh, dad, yeah, kind of like, and just as I'm kind of getting the connection there a little, my mother calls me and she says, and you happen to have your cell phone. I had my None cell phone. None of us remember to carry back in the day when they first came out. It wasn't as vital as it is now. Yeah. And we still had a house phone even. So, yeah. Um, she said, Terry, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but your aunt has passed away. And just as she tells me that, the, the left corner of my bedroom becomes light. And I can see in my head, not, not, it wasn't, you know, I can see my aunt sitting on the stairs crying. In that screaming. church in that church and then i see a light move towards her and lighten it up and she has this look on her face like oh my god it's you and i i knew what happened my when she died my dad had to go to her he had to go be with her yeah he had to go meet her that is so beautiful it is yeah oh so, my god 
it was beautiful, but it's like I didn't know who to cry for first. My dad, the cat, myself, you know. The cat, <laughs> obviously. Animals are more important than humans. <laughs> we would always cry for the cat first. It's like my dad died again. Again. Yeah, I can imagine. Oh my yeah. god. My dad died. You know, do I cry for my aunt too? Oh my god. I know when my husband died, we um had our posse is what I called them. It was my father and um, David's mother and a couple of other, other entities that were always around. And when David died, it was like, I lost this entire group of people. You know, they all, they were all gone now. So I have no way to communicate because I'm not the psychic in the family. So I get it. Absolutely okay. get that. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful that you got to spend that time with your dad and with him as a cat. I know. It's and, beautiful. You know, it doesn't hurt my feelings if people don't believe it, but because it, it is a little bit, un, you know, it's kind of like, wow, I just didn't know it. But it also kind of represents don't put God in a box. We don't know everything. You know, it used to be thought that you, if you, if there was reincarnation, you're definitely coming back as a person. But I guess you can choose. I think you can choose. It's your soul contract. It's free will. You can choose whatever you want to be. I told you the story. I have a, um, a um, pyramid, a little a crystal pyramid, and there's two entities in it because they wanted to see what it was like to be a crystal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they and, live in this crystal in my garden. <laughs> and you know their names. And I do know, but I can't remember them right now. I keep forgetting their names. But it's like yeah. how cool is Gretchen that? and Holly or something like that. It's just two like Valley Girl names that I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you get something from spirit, you expect it to have some spiritual name and feel all. No, it's like Gretchen and Carla. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the normal thing. Oh, Terry, thank you so much for your stories, for coming thank here you. today. We just, so, you make me laugh so, so much. <laughs> it's just, it's, I'm on a high when I get off the show with you every yeah. time because of the giggles. I just love it. And thank you for letting me tell my wild stories because I got a lot of wild, wild tales. They are heartwarming. They are all absolutely heartwarming. Yes. And everybody in the chat, thanks for joining us today. I realize it's after... We actually went over, so woohoo! Wow. <laughs> I, I like when, when we hit an hour, so that's brilliant. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I hope you Thank enjoyed you it, and we'll please leave comments. So uh, if anything resonated, or and leave your stories about your fur babies, because we know how important they are for yeah. sure. In my Got case, it. much more important than any human in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm. Everyone should know I'm going to check back once this gets posted and, you know, see if there's any comments about animal stories, because I think they're amazing. Amazing. They are amazing. amazing. And we love to read your stuff, whatever you put in the chat room. And we can't do it when we're talking because it's just too hard to keep up with everything, as you well right. know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you guys and, know. And it's hard so. I'm on my phone and the, 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 uh, the, um, font is so little it's and I got, tiny. I got the the triple things there and I know. Yeah. It's, it's and even possible. though the font is not tiny my old eyes just can't read it <laughs> I think the font's tiny up here on the uh, YouTube stuff I mean StreamYard I think it's it's, it's tiny. very difficult to, unless ah! you're right on it yeah and it's like I said, it stays the same size no matter how big how you big make we it make or how screen. small you make it. It still stays the same size. So, so what have you got going on this week? Who you go, you were already on with Allie this morning, which I got to go watch. And yeah. what's next for you? I tomorrow at I think two or two thirty, um, I'm going to be on with Jean, just Jean and I together. Oh, uh, yeah, that's good. We. We normally would be on with Joan, but Joan mm -hmm. is uh, driving right now. Oh, so, so she's, she's traveling like, back to the States? Yeah, yeah. So and she's in Mexico. Yeah. For a while. For a while. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it'll just be me and Jean tomorrow in the afternoon, and anyone can drop by and um, 
ask questions. And what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to probably do what we did before, which is kind of take it a little bit easier, not try to answer so many questions and allow the visions to develop and to get oh, more. I love it when you do that. I yeah, have to watch. That's good. I'll have yeah. to watch. Very good. Sure. So be sure and do that. And whose channel is it on yours or Jean's? It's going to be on Jean's. Jean's channel. Okay. And we're going to do a show on Tuesday on Marsuro Emoto. I'm not sure I said is the M word right. Masuro <laughs> Emoto, the water. And oh, and the effects the on effects it. Of and our how word, we affect it. How we can affect oh, you, water. Wow. And if we can affect water like that, what percent of our body is water? Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Masuro, a lot. Yeah. How do you say M-A-S-A-R-U? Masur, Masur, Masur. Anyway, sure. Emoto. Um, wow. Google, you'll you'll find him. It, yeah. It's fascinating the work that he did on water. Yeah, and, and it's uh, so relevant frequency. to us. So, what time is your show? What our shows are on Tuesdays and Saturdays at three p.m. Oh. Eastern. Pretty Yay. much standard. It's when we do Sunday or Fridays that we have odd times, but this is Tuesday. Tuesday. So, mm -hmm. Masuru Emoto. That's exactly right. Thank you. I will tune in. I want to know more about that. Yeah, it should be fun. And then, um, you know what? I can't remember who we have next week. We have somebody next Friday, next Sunday. Sunday. I, don't I think remember. it might be Scott because it's kind of the end of the month already, isn't it? Yeah, so we'll have to check. But we'll anyway, let you know. We'll, we'll let you know. And Terry, have a great rest of your weekend. <laughs> You guys, please go out, shine your light, send that love out to the universe, to our earth that needs all the help it can get. Send all your problems to earth. She loves them. She gets she better loves on to them. Eat so our negative energy. Yes. Yeah, so send it down to her and send out unconditional love to the rest of the world. Especially those people you really don't like very much. They need it the <laughs> most. Know, that's true. And so does your heart. So, so does your heart. Sending it to them does. As Both much of good us. for you as it does for them. Exactly. So, so Terry, come back and visit us soon. Bye to the I'm chat room. We love you guys. The chat room. You know. Thank you, Terry. And thanks for You're being welcome. here. Thank you. Okay.